The Federal Reserve is incompatible with democracy. Fiat currency or paper money is printed out of thin air by a central authority and therefore is weakened by inflation and taxation. Though independent, the institution is hyper-politicized and headed only by those who share a secret handshake with the president. Taxpayer-funded bailouts to megabanks JP Morgan Chase and Goldman Sachs perpetuate these financial thought crimes as the Fed's checkbook is conveniently withheld from the public and unaccountable to annual audits. Fort Knox 2 is merely a relic, a symbol of what previously housed the gold used to back the now debt-based US dollar. Government-regulated banks are equally hopeless, transferring money at a glacial pace, charging steep transaction fees, and audaciously freezing customers' assets. Now, imagine a technology that could disrupt this paradigm and pose itself an alternative to the hijacked US dollar. Fortunately, the peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system Bitcoin is all but fictitious. Already has the virtual currency stirred up controversy by threatening traditional banking and even circumventing state authority. How does Bitcoin work? What are its pros and cons? Why do Bitcoins have value? Answers to all those questions and more, featuring guest commentary from peace activist Derek J and Bitcoin evangelist Jeffrey Tucker, coming up. Private, non-national electronic currencies like Microsoft Points, Facebook Credits, eGold, and the Liberty Dollar are nothing new. They have existed for decades. Unlike these currencies, however, Bitcoin is the world's first completely decentralized payment network, freeing people to transact on their own terms rather than through third parties like PayPal or Western Union. In other words, transmitting Bitcoins is a two-party transaction that does not require an intermediary. You become your own bank. You are the one with the authority to send money along this network. Bitcoin is also open source. This means any developer can examine Bitcoin's protocol and code because it is non-proprietary. Much like the internet, no single company owns Bitcoin. Rather, services like AT&T and Comcast, in the case of internet, provide users access to the architecture. In the case of Bitcoin, exchanges like Bitstamp and Coinbase enable investors to buy and sell Bitcoins using different currencies, the dollar, euro, yen, etc. Put simply, Bitcoin is equally owned by its adoptees. Each person has as much power as the next. At any one time, everybody knows exactly and precisely how many Bitcoins there are and how many transactions there are, how many wallet holders there are, what the velocity of Bitcoin is at any one time. I mean, you can just know everything that's going on about it. So the transparency feature is, is extraordinary. Money and payment systems have always been two separate sides of the same coin. However, Bitcoin is first to embed both characteristics into one technology. The e-currency likewise operates on what inventor Satoshi Nakamoto called the blockchain. It's just a big ledger in the sky that keeps very careful track of who's sending what to whom and does not allow for any double spending. A copy of this real-time public ledger is maintained on every computer or node in Bitcoin's distributed network. So, without involving a mint or a trusted central authority, nodes verify transactions to prove currency is not reused and or replicated by its sender. Users who expend computer power to process these transactions are called miners. In the course of, of engaging in these confirmations and verifications, their computers are running mathematical algorithms to dig up new Bitcoin at a rate of something like 25 every 10 minutes or so. So that in itself is a gigantic industry. Some young people have started saying, well, hey, I've got a machine at home that I'm not putting to use. Why not when I'm at school or when I'm at work, I put my machine to use mining these Bitcoins or Litecoin or whatever else you want to mine. And they're seeing, hey, this can supplement my allowance or maybe I don't get any allowance and this is a new income source for me. You can spend your Bitcoins in the real world 
and, and mine them at home. Bitcoin mining, analogous to gold mining, incentivizes users to contribute their resources to the collective by rewarding them uncirculated currency. Typically, the way people increase their odds of winning is they'll join a pool and they'll pool their computing resources together and then they'll extract profits in proportion to how much computing power they offered. All miners acquire bitcoins, but not all bitcoins are acquired through mining. Of an estimated 70,000 daily transactions, bitcoins are earned as payment for goods or services, purchased at bitcoin exchanges, or physically exchanged with local users. Akin to denominations of the dollar, pennies, nickels, dimes, and quarters, Bitcoin users may buy or sell in fractional units, like for example, one milli bitcoin, one one thousandth of a bitcoin, or one micro bitcoin, one one millionth of a bitcoin. So we're gonna have to adjust our thinking. We might have to get good at math even. Paying in bitcoin though is easier and cheaper than swiping a debit or credit card at the grocery store. Computer and smartphone-based applications like blockchain.info and Bitcoin Wallet respectively equip users with a personal Bitcoin account or wallet, much like a bank account, and allow Bitcoins to either be sent and received online or securely stored offline. All transaction fees are nominal, costing only a few pennies in value. And, with no more than a few keystrokes or the scan of a QR code, users can transact instantaneously and globally. So you can see that it's uniquely suited for internet age, which is why there's so much excitement about it. Bitcoin may also excite poverty-stricken economies around the globe by providing access to the one-third of humanity excluded from the financial world. Once those people are included, using a technology like Bitcoin, so all you have to have is a cell phone and suddenly you can be part of the global economic system, we're going to see an explosion of prosperity like we've never seen before. The lifting of the Iron Curtain that happened at the end of the Cold War is going to be nothing compared to what we're going to see once uh, the world's poor and unbanked and less developed economies uh, get hold of Bitcoin and start using it, which they already are. It's going to be Amazing. A bar of gold lacks intrinsic value to he who starves. As with all currency, Bitcoin's value comes only and directly from people willing to accept them as payment. Both online services like Amazon and WordPress and brick and mortar businesses like Subway and Tesla Motors have not only legitimized Bitcoin but have also disproven the intuition that virtual means valueless. The main source of value in our digital age is in fact uh, ones and zeros. I mean, this conversation we're, we're having right now is enormously valuable. It doesn't exist in real life. It's just rendered uh, through a series of protocols. This is the way the world works nowadays. What's more are Bitcoin's six unique properties that mimic those of the gold standard. One, durability. All Bitcoins can be lost, but not destroyed. Two, divisibility. All Bitcoins can be divided down to the eighth decimal place. Three, fungibility. All Bitcoins are equal. Four, portability. All Bitcoins are spaceless and weightless, with the exception of physical cascaceous coins. Five, recognizability. All Bitcoins are universally accepted by adoptees as money. And six, scarcity. All Bitcoins are issued at a fixed deflationary rate, and no additional Bitcoins are issued after 21 million are mined. The purchasing power or utility of Bitcoin is ultimately its source of value. When people see, oh, I can spend Bitcoins on Amazon, Zappos, and real world stores like The Gap, okay, I'll take it. The market also determines Bitcoin's price. When demand for Bitcoins increases, price increases. When demand falls, price falls. If you're in a place like Argentina, for example, Bitcoins go for about 30% more than the global average. Why that is? They're more in demand than the local Argentine currency. You can do more with Bitcoin than the local currency. Capitalizing on this economic law of supply and demand are Bitcoin speculators, whose greed may blow a speculative bubble 
or more importantly, ignite market volatility with a capital V. The exchange rate in early 2013 was a negligible $15 per Bitcoin, a small fortune of $1,100 less than 12 months later, and is currently an investment to the tune of $550 per Bitcoin. Still, splashing water in a lake makes less of an impact than splashing in a kiddie pool. The US dollar's $1 trillion market cap belittles Bitcoin's $7 million. Because the total value of Bitcoins in circulation and the number of businesses using Bitcoin are still very small, relatively insignificant events, trades, or business practices can significantly affect the price. For Bitcoin's price to stabilize, a large-scale economy needs to develop with more businesses and users. But for a large-scale economy to develop, businesses and users will seek price stability. Above all, Choices made by investors cause fluctuation in Bitcoin's price. One predictable facet of Bitcoin is not price, but security. It's not like Bitcoin is on one server and anyone can aim their sights on that server and take it down. That would be a serious vulnerability. The magic and the promise of Bitcoin is that it's decentralized. The fact that I run my own node here at home, keeps the network alive and secure. So how secure is it? As secure as the internet. Governed by military-grade cryptography, transactions contain neither sensitive nor personal information. User error, on the other hand, is Bitcoin's Achilles heel. A lot of new technologies that are replacing the state are dependent on personal responsibility. And that's something that Americans are unfamiliar with. The government has done a good job of training its obedient slaves to forget how to be personally responsible for their actions and their money and their security. But we need to relearn it and quickly because Bitcoin actually gives you freedom if you have the responsibility to use that freedom to your advantage. Since wallet files can be accidentally deleted, lost, or stolen, similar to physical cash stored in digital form, every Bitcoin wallet generates two matching digital keys or identities, one private, one public. The encrypted private key allows Bitcoins to be spent and, like a four-digit voicemail security pin, is accessible only to the user logging into the wallet. Like a phone number, the separate public key serves as the send to address, representing a possible destination for a Bitcoin payment. Also available are two options of wallet storage, hot and cold. Hot wallets, checking accounts, are connected to the internet and are visible within the blockchain. And so people can see that address and see that it has uh, money associated with it. Users can employ sound security practices or cold storage savings accounts by physically securing a reserve of Bitcoins offline, commonly using a paper wallet in either a safety deposit box or a fireproof safe. This is a totally new concept to humanity. In the past, we've had to trust our accountants, we've had to trust our bankers or our, our tellers that they're using this information and they're doing what we want them to do. Now, we can depend on code, and that means it's up to us to execute that code correctly. A discussion of Bitcoin is incomplete without mention of Mt. Gox, a Tokyo-based exchange handling 70% of all Bitcoin transactions up until February 28th 2014. The company suspended trading, closed its website, filed for a form of bankruptcy, and announced 850,000 bitcoins belonging to customers were missing and likely stolen, an amount then valued at more than $450 million. There's a glimmer of hope in this story. Just because the largest bitcoin exchange fails doesn't mean it's the end of bitcoin. And unlike the markets that we see today with the financial sector of, oh, we're bankrupt, bail us out, there is no bailout. They don't get a bailout from the government. And you know what? The world doesn't stop. If Bank of America is robbed, is the US dollar compromised? 
The answer is an unequivocal no. Security breaches and theft imply not inherent flaws in Bitcoin, but corporate incompetence. So it's kind of the Wild West, in a way. I mean, we just saw with the Mt. Gox failure, you know, what happens to bad actors in the space. They go belly up. By cheating the system, an attacker would undermine the validity of his own wealth. It's more profitable to play by the rules. But is Bitcoin so secure it facilitates the very breaking of those rules? Money has historically been used both for legal and illegal purposes. Currency would be ineffective could it not purchase, for example, recreational narcotics, the second most traded commodity on the planet after food. Coined eBay for drugs, the notorious, anonymous, underground, and Bitcoin-only marketplace Silk Road listed for sale heroin, LSD, cannabis, and other contraband. Regulators aren't going to like that because they're going to say that people are laundering money. Oh, they're putting in cash bills and then using that Bitcoin to buy drugs with it. Oh no! People have never used cash to buy drugs. Cash, credit cards, and current banking systems have an unsurprisingly firmer link to the criminal underworld. Cash is anonymous, Bitcoin is pseudonymous. People want a currency that's sort of anonymous. I think that's sort of the appeal of cash. People like that they can keep it under their mattress, in a tin can, they can hold it, they have control over it, and they can give it to who they want no strings attached or questions asked. With Bitcoin, each user is perfectly hidden, yet every transaction is readily accessible. Furthermore, Bitcoin is designed to prevent, not abet, a large range of financial crimes like counterfeit, fraud, and identity theft. Not dissimilar to a knife dicing tomatoes instead of bodies, Bitcoin is simply a means to an end and depends exclusively on users' intentions whether righteous or nefarious. Quoted from Ross Albright, aka Dread Pirate Roberts, the alleged mastermind behind Silk Road, quote, we've won the state's war on drugs because of Bitcoin. This, however, is not the only war to be won for Bitcoin. The apparent crooks is instead regulation. It's actually a physical impossibility for government to regulate the blockchain. You know, there's, there's too many copies of it. You can, if there's a trillion copies, you destroy all but one. Uh, that one that remains can replicate itself trillions of times uh, within seconds. What government can regulate is users' point of entry into Bitcoin. What a lot of people do is they want to work with Bitcoin exchanges through their bank accounts, and that's really great, unless the government says to banks, you may not accept any customers who are buying and selling Bitcoin through their uh, bank accounts, which government hasn't said that, but a lot of banks are really squeamish about it. The Internal Revenue Service on Tuesday declared Bitcoin not currency, but property, subject to capital gains and losses, applying the same rules used to govern stocks and bonds. So that if you buy Bitcoin and sell it again, and make a profit, they can easily tax it, which they, which they presumably uh, do right now, which is a little bit problematic. Has Uncle Sam overstepped his regulatory bounds and quashed an icon of the libertarian dream, or given credence to an otherwise marginal curiosity of a tiny segment of the population? Time will tell. Politicians and regulators are not going to like people having freedom to do what they want with their currency, because they'll probably be exchanging fiat for something better. The challenge for regulators, as always, is to develop efficient solutions while not impairing the growth of new emerging markets and businesses. People do not always marry the first person they date. Similarly, Bitcoin's current appeal may be overshadowed by the next alternative coin, like Dogecoin or Litecoin. Over a thousand altcoins have already been created, and what do they do? Well, Dogecoin has a different way of being mined. It can be mined a little bit easier, and so people are more inclined to mine Dogecoin than they will Bitcoin. Literally anyone can make their own currency by modifying Bitcoin software and cherry-picking its best features. This is a kind of a, a natural free enterprise competition taking place, and it's the same sense that with, with tennis shoes or whatever, you know, when Nike comes out with 
a cool new way to close the shoes on the top or you know some some, some new type tread on the bottom you know, a new style a new color whatever everybody's desperate to copy it you know if it becomes successful and that's good i mean that's how can we have progress in the world is that we have people copying each other's successes but since new altcoins are programmed into existence every day won't massive inflation devalue the cryptocurrency sector as a whole? That's really a confusion because each altcoin exists in its own blockchain ledger. That's in its own separate ecosphere, separate from every other. Comparable to the US dollar and the euro, altcoins do not mix. One currency cannot inflate or deflate any other. Never before have fiat currencies' protection against normal market forces been threatened by alternative currencies. Bitcoin absolutely could replace the Federal Reserve and uh, fiat currencies. It's going to do that by competing on the open market. This is something that the government doesn't want and doesn't allow. And I'm shocked to see Ben Bernanke, of all people, say that Bitcoin holds long-term promise. For once, he's being honest. Vestigial anxieties of Bitcoin have been met with little to no resolve. Some theorists criticize the digital currency, and rightfully so, on grounds of controlled opposition, a honey trap for the resistance, or even a Ponzi scheme so clever, Bernie Madoff is jealous. Ironically, Bitcoin strips from men in suits the ability to finance their own activities such as America's wars on terror and drugs, and likewise is apolitical. By the same token, Bitcoin is censorship resistant. Regulators have the ability to punish users for transacting after the fact, but cannot prevent them from doing so in the first place. What do we have control over in our lives anymore? Uh, with, with governments intruding on free will at every waking moment, uh, it's refreshing to have a technology that puts power back in the hands of people. But this may not be true. Bitcoin will not fracture the status quo of central banking unless and until it gains mainstream traction. For any new technology, there's a leap that has to take place. So, you know, we're at that point at the beginning where it's, it's creeping up, creeping up. Um, user adoption is starting to explode. But if we don't make this leap between techie users and average users, and we don't make it quickly, Bitcoin might never take off. So is Bitcoin a colloquial middle finger to the man, the antithesis of the US dollar, or a Trojan horse, the catalyst for a cashless society? Bitcoin is money, and money, like it or not, is power. If you think Bitcoin is interesting, don't wait for someone to hold your hand through it. Google it. We live in the age of information. So for you to be ignorant about a topic that you're sincerely interested in, there is no excuse for that. Educate yourself. You owe it to yourself. The question then becomes, will you cash in or cash out on the cash list? Is Bitcoin a boom or a bust? You decide. <laughs>